Professor Bryn Brown's research shows that vulnerability fosters good emotional and mental health. It is a sign of courage. We become more resilient and brave when we embrace who we truly are and what we are feeling. The Vulnerable Scientist Podcast is a space for scientists to tell their honest and authentic stories. I am your host, Sarah Nyakeri, who happens to be a scientist, informal science communicator, and I help scientists create personal websites. If you want to support this show, go to www.patreon.com slash the vulnerable scientist. You can also follow this podcast on all social media platforms at TV Scientist Pod. Hi everyone, welcome to the Vulnerable Scientist Podcast. This is your host, Sarah Nyakeri, and today I have Laura with me, and I'm so excited to have um, this conversation and hear her story. Hi, Laura. Hi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Thanks for accepting to come to this podcast. Um, I understand that you were supposed to do the podcast earlier on, then I don't know what happened. I think it's me. Uh at a last minute thing then we had to postpone but i'm happy that we finally can do it now hey thanks for the invite i'm happy to be here okay great um so um laura uh maybe say your names the way you would like them to be said and introduce yourself to someone who doesn't know you sure um hi everyone my name is laura harris um i'm the senior bioinformatics scientist at neuro x1 which is a little startup company in the United States that is doing computational drug design and de- for neurological disorders. So um, I've been there probably three, four months because we are new um, and super excited to, to get started. Prior to that, I was um, a director of training for the Institute for Cyber Enabled Research at Michigan State University. Um, I was the assistant professor and science laboratory coordinator at Davenport University, um, where I also started my own little bioinformatic and experimental wet bench research group uh, called the Harris Interdisciplinary Research. And um, I've just been in and out of industry and academia for 20 plus years at this point. Um, Got my bachelor's in microbiology from Michigan State University in 2000. I have a master's of science in microbiology, a second master's of science in cell and molecular biology. Uh, both those are from Michigan State. Um, I joked at that point they were tired of having me as a student. Um, so I went to Rutgers, um, the State University of New Jersey, to get my PhD in biomedical informatics um, while I was an assistant professor at Davenport, but um, yeah, worked at all sorts of industry places, like I work at Pfizer um, back in the day, a place called Bioport, who's now Emergent Biosolutions, doing things with the anthrax vaccine. Um, Pfizer was preclinical dermatology compound development, but, but anyway, enough about me. We cannot get enough with you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I love that that um, brief introduction of who you are. It gives me a concept. It's interesting that you've been in, in industry and in academia. So I'm sure yes. you have good perspective of both sides. Oh, yeah. Over 20 years, you get to see the highs and lows of everything. And it's exciting that you're now in a startup company. I love it. I feel like I'm coming home finally. When did you know you wanted to get into science? Could you ask, also tell us a little bit of background of where you grew up and all that, if you want to? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I guess long story short, I really like the challenge of working in medicine. Mm -hmm. So when I went to do my undergraduate at Michigan State University, um, I wanted to go to medical school. And why? why? Oh, I'm sorry. Why? Uh, I wanted to deal in medicine and like the challenge of medicine. So, you know, the mystery of here are these symptoms. What is causing this? Is there a way that I can impact that and help the patient? Mm. So, I mean, I guess it's a combination of just sheer curiosity along with this drive to also want to help humanity um 
which I guess is kind of why I enjoyed teaching for so many years. But mm -hmm. anyway, um, I ended up, instead of going to medical school, going to graduate school. Um, for several different reasons, the main one being medical school wouldn't take me at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm happy they didn't, because okay. I found now that I do much better working with computers and petri dish and mice and data mm -hmm. and not so much with you know whining patients <laughs> what makes you think you find whining patients <laughs> hey we all uh get a little bit down when we're sick so yeah so you imagine okay that's interesting um i don't know um uh, which uh what 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 am i too loud on your on your headset no you actually quieted down but i can still hear you i quieted down because I, I can't hear myself so i'm trying to try and get that echo off your recording i'll keep and going i can hear you it's a little struggle how about now you're fine Go ahead. Okay. Don't worry. I'll edit these parts out, so don't worry about it. Fair enough. Yeah, so um, what about, t tell us the journey before before going into undergrad. How did you, like, where, when did you know what you wanted to do medicine? Because that's the in initial idea before you got into undergraduate, right? Well, I mean... I knew going into undergrad, that's what I wanted to do. Mm. I wasn't really aware of all the different caveats of medicine. Mm -hmm. So, like, my first internship as an undergrad was a combination of radiology and infectious disease. Frankly, I had never heard of microbiology prior to that summer. So, you know, saying that I wanted to go into microbiology when I was in high school is just not possible. I didn't know microbiology existed then. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's even complicated further by the idea that I'm now in bioinformatics. Yeah. Um, so that whole field didn't even exist when yeah. I was an undergrad. It was just barely coming out when I was starting as a PhD. Mm -hmm. And that was a good six, seven years ago now. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of things change. And if I had told myself then that I would be here now, I probably would have scratched my head and been like, really? That's not where I see myself going. Mm. But I'm very glad that I'm here. Mm. So wh growing up, what did you want to be? Right now, what do I want to be? No, growing up, what did you want to be when you were growing up? <laughs> um, an opera singer originally, but, you know, mm. <laughs> you really need a voice for that, and I don't exactly have one. Um, Wait, have you tried I mean, it later on in your life? Like, uh, try to sing? Well, I mean, I was in choir through high school and college, and um, when I was at my initial college, I, I was a transfer student to Michigan State. Mm. Um, my initial college actually gave me a very small scholarship for music. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up transferring to Michigan State because the place I was at was too small, didn't have the courses I needed for a robust medical school application. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, I still sing in the car and drive my family crazy when I go places. <laughs> Oh, okay. So you've never attempted to be in a group or to go into music, like, uh, in some sort of way later on? I feel very connected to music. Um, I just no longer participate in group music. Okay. Mm, okay. All right. So um, what uh, what is that thing that made you know you could go to graduate school and not medical school like when you got rejected or rather i don't know if what we said that you could not get into med school because of something correct um 
Well, I mean, I was always taught you have a plan, mm. and then you also have backup plan. Yeah. Particularly yeah. with something as important as your career. Mm. And so in my particular case, I wanted to go to medical school at the time. That was my plan A. Mm-hmm. But the Department of Microbiology at Michigan State had just opened a combined bachelor's and master's program. Mm -hmm. So then I didn't have to have the GRE. I didn't have to have letters. I just had to apply to this program and have a certain GPA already in the major. Yeah. So basically the same professor, uh, Dr. Jackson, who became my mentor for that master's thesis mm -hmm. uh, was the person who told me about that program mm -hmm. and encouraged me to apply as like a safety in case medical school did not take me. Mm. So that's kind of how I started with that master's. Um, and at the same time also decided to diversify um, to get industry experience, if you will. Mm -hmm. How how did you do that? Oh, well, I started as a 21-year-old teacher mm. at the Lansing Community College, uh, which oddly, my daughter attends classes there now as a dual enrollment high school student. Oh, okay. Talk about coming full circle. I was in the same yeah. parking lot I taught in waiting for her yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I did that for a year, teaching microbiology lecture and lab. Mm -hmm. um, and then at that point, I went to work for Bioport and um, started doing research and development for the anthrax vaccine. Um, I defended my master's while I was at Bioport, I think like two months into my tenure there. Um, so that okay. got me out of academia for a while. Okay, so this is, uh, so before, after the BSc, this period after the BSc and the MSc, you didn't do anything at this period, right? Well, I mean, I worked. So, you know, okay. I was a research associate at Bioport. I then left there and went to work at Pfizer. I was the scientific project associate there. Um, and so that was a good five years of my life after my BSMS. No, I mean, I mean before the MSc. No, I really didn't. I mean, I had my internships at Beaumont Hospital, um, where I kind of got a feel for what infectious disease and radiology were about. Um, I mean, I had a poster and a paper that were published out of that work, which wow. was cool and kind of helped, but, you know. Tell us more about that, like that stint before you got into your master's. How did you get there? What were you working on exactly? Okay. Um, well, I mean, for the internship, I really got it from dogged pers persistence. Um, I knew that the medical doctors liked to play golf at the local club on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I took my bag and I sat on the first tee. And any threesome that came along, I would say, excuse me, could I please join you? Mm -hmm. And... I mean, the groundskeeper wasn't happy. They complained. They told me to go home and stop bothering the doctors. But wow. usually within the first hour of me doing this, a group of doctors would say, hey, sure, we like your motivation. Come play with us. And that mm -hmm. basically gave me like four hours to talk to them, learn about them, get to know them. And that eventually led to one of them, uh, Dr. Dwayne Meswa, offering me an unpaid internship mm -hmm. to shadow him in radiology mm -hmm. and also to work with Dr. Zervos in infectious disease um, because they misread my major at Michigan State to be microbiology when it was really biochemistry. Oh, okay. But that got me into the microbiology lab where I could start learning things. And then after that summer, I got a poster um, at a conference. And so I'm like, well, uh, apparently I'm good at this. Mm -hmm. So why don't I change my major? So that's what I did. You changed your major to microbiology in the middle yes. of doing your biochemistry degree. This was yes. in which year? 
Junior, going into junior. Oh, okay. So this is the second, or the first, um, f- first rising, second year. Rising into the third year. Third year, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so, okay. But somehow well, you I, came I, back. I, to... mm-hmm. Sorry? I went into college with a year already done in credit. So I did my undergrad in three years after high school graduation. Oh, okay. That's interesting. So depending on your credit, you can actually do less years. Oh, yeah. My daughters are currently flying through high school. Like my oldest daughter right now Mm. is looking to get her associate's degree at the same time she graduates high school. Wow. So then she'll be two years out of high school with her bachelor's. Oh, so you can enroll into a university before you finish your schooling high school, right? If, if you're responsible enough, yes. Oh, hi, that's nice. I, I like that. It I is. like that system. Yes, not very many people take advantage of it, but that's mm. another story. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Um, so what happens uh, in this lab environment, the infectious lab environment that made you, what is that thing that made you go into graduate school? Like going, because I'm, I'm understanding that you did microbiology after that, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, so what is that thing that happened in that space that was like, you were like, I, I want to do this? Well, I mean, infectious disease just made sense from a global perspective. Mm. Humans have always been locked in war with microbes since the beginning of time. Mm. I'm waiting for this car to go by. There it goes. Um, not sure if you can hear the background noise when that happens or not. Yeah, I okay. Can, yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, so because of that, I mean, I knew medicine was going to be important, so I wanted to pursue medicine. Mm. So infectious disease just seemed like this logical progression of, well, you know, we keep dying from things like antibiotic resistance or, well, COVID. Mm. And so I have this opportunity to focus in that area. I'm good at it. It's interesting to me. So I stuck with it. Mm. Um, Everything else within medicine that was in my reach at that time was all clinical and needed an MD or a DO degree, Mm. which then kind of shifted my direction because I did not go for an MD or a DO degree. So technically I can do biomedical stuff like research, but I can't directly prescribe medication to patients. Yeah. Um, which has its pros and cons, but you know, it is what it is. Like what, what, what did you say? DO? What is DO? A uh, doctor of obstetrics, I believe osteopathy, something like that. To be honest, it's been so long. I forget. In the United States, a DO and an MD effectively have the same medical practice privileges, Mm -hmm. but their education is slightly different. A medical doctor tends to be more um, Western medicine, so to speak, whereas a DO will do things like um, chiropractic or um, some sort of a reflexology or more likely to take a natural approach than an MD is. There are campaigns in Kenya, so it's a little bit noisy today. <laughs> Did you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. yeah I'm saying that there are campaigns in Kenya, so it's a little bit noise on my side, so I muted myself. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question or not. Yeah, it it kind of did. It kind of did answer my question. So there isn't much difference between MD and DO. We still have no. the same privileges, but this, the the education, where you come from, it's different. A little bit, yes. They effectively take most of the same classes. It's just slightly different emphasis. Oh, okay, okay. But to get into both courses, you still need a BSc. Yes, and you take the MCATs and a bunch of other stuff. The entrance requirements are similar. Oh, okay, okay. Great. Uh-huh, so... Um, so at this point you're doing research, which kind of research are you doing for the infectious disease? Can you talk more about that? If you can remember. 
Oh, I can. Trust um. me. Um, so at Beaumont, my internships as an undergraduate, uh, there I was dealing with uh, mainly Lactobacillus acidophilus, mm-hmm. which is a probiotic organism that you get in your colon based on drinking milk as an infant. It's a, um, how do I put this? It's one of the first bacteria to colonize a newborn's gut. Mm. And there was a disease, um, pseudomembranous colitis, which is caused by a bacterial overgrowth of this organism called Clostridium difficile, or C. diff for short. Mm. And so my question basically was that I was seeing these patients with C. diff in the hospital, and I wondered if giving them a probiotic like lactobacillus would improve their condition or maybe prevent them from getting it altogether. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I got out Petri dishes and I mixed cultures together with varying concentrations of Clostridium and Lactobacilli. Mm. And I watched what they grew as, you know, how many Clostridium would be in a culture based Mm. on how many Lactobacilli I included in that culture. Mm -hmm. And then varied the number of Lactobacilli across culture. And what I found was that the lactobacilli inhibited the growth of the clostridium. Mm-hmm. Don't know how that occurs, but I found that it occurs. Mm-hmm. And so that actually started a whole change of practice within the hospital, where if a patient was at risk of developing pseudomembranous colitis, they would then preemptively have been given yogurt as part of their diet, Uh, to try to build up those lactobacilli so they were easier to treat and didn't have complications from the disease later on. So that was a pretty cool project that I got to develop on my own. You mean they they affected the changes immediately after your results? I wouldn't say immediately. It did take some time. Um, particularly to build up the lactobacilli concentrations. Mm. Um, bacteria need to grow just like humans do. Yeah. But, um, yeah, over time, if you kept introducing the lactobacilli, it prevented the overgrowth of the clostridium. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. I used to explain, yeah, I used to explain it to my students this way. Mm. You have a neighborhood of empty houses. Mm-hmm. You can have good neighbors, mm-hmm. or you can have bad neighbors. If mm-hmm. you put good neighbors in the houses, you're less likely to have the bad neighbors move in. Mm. That's 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 a good explanation. 